Welcome back to the summer school. Our next session is about high performance data analytics and visualization. And it's led by Den Donatello Elia from CMCC and Niklas Röber from Dikara Z. So I'm looking forward to this session. Please go ahead, Niklas and Donatello. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and um, great to be here. Um, so the first session will be about Paraview, um, will be presented by DKRZ, and the next session um, that will be presented by Donatello. But um, before I will start, I will just um, would like you to uh, go to the link that I provided um, that leads you to a next cloud or folder. There you can find the PDF of this presentation and also two very small net CDF files. They're just five megabytes each. Um, the idea that I had laid out for the first 90 minutes is that I give you an overview presentation of about 90 minutes. And um, after that, um, we'll just um, have some hands-on Paraview tutorial. So you can either follow me using these two small examples if you have Paraview installed, or you can just um, look and watch what I'm doing. Uh, you can use um, the Paraview version that um, Julian has provided um, in his um, uh, image, or you can just go to paraview.org and download the software yourself and install it while I'm just presenting a couple of slides. So first, um, some introduction, why is visualization important, some visualization examples um, to increase your appetite of creating cool and insightful visualizations. Then a few slides about um, what to do when you have really very large data sets. And then um, for maybe uh, 60 minutes or so, some hands-on examples with a live demonstration on using Paraview using these two small data files. OK, um, so let's go right ahead. At DKZ, we provide regular visualization workshops. These are hands-on tutorials for Paraview, NCL, and Vapor, and they usually last from two to five days, and they're generally very intense. So in this image, you can see a setting. We do this for 25 to 30 participants, and um, <clears throat> we not only use um, the data that we provide, but in the end, there's also some time allotted that uh, we look at the data that everyone brings in, so um, try to visualize their data in the session so that everyone has something out of it. There are some online tutorials available um, at DKZ website. At the end of the presentation, there's uh, some links, some resources. There's also this link available. And uh, we are also on the verge of um, preparing some online training videos that we will upload to the DKZ website and um, also to YouTube. And as part of Easy Ways 2, um, both CMCC and DKZ, we talked about that we would like to also host a dedicated data analytics and visualization workshop either at um, CMCC's or DKZ premises. Um, something like a setting that you see in the image below where we will train um, you and um, to work with, with your data and the different models that are part of uh, Easy Ways. My most experience, of course, as I'm working at DKZ and in close collaboration with MPIM is ICANN. So this is an image of um, the tutorial website that, Paraview, uh, that DKZ hosts for Paraview. If you just Google for DKZ and Paraview, you will just um, directly jump on that page and there's some more information on using the GPU nodes on Mistral, um, how to launch Paraview, and also some short tutorials on how to get your data in, how to set a color table, how to visualize your data, how to create an animation, and so on. What is um, the generalization work at DKZ? So what are we doing? Um, we, and especially I, am very interested in looking at ways to work and also interact with large data. While in most cases, it's comforting to know that you can really run very large simulations, but you can't do anything with it if you are not able to look inside the data and get insight and more inf and, and new information out of it. So you must be able to extract information and knowledge from the data. Otherwise, there would be no need of doing some simulations. And um, for very large data sets, um, there are two possibilities, either to use in situation. Um, for this one, you can use Paraview and Catalyst. Or you can go uh, in another direction using compression and progressive data validation techniques. Here we are working together with um, NCAR and Boulder in Colorado. 
and um, they decode, uh, they encode their the data sets using wavelets, and um, yeah, transform the data into a progressive form, and then later um, use these compressed level of detail data to visualize also large data sets. And um, we're also interested in bad relation on Mistral. Um, it's good that you can do everything um, using a GUI, but it's also interesting to just um, submit the relation job just like um, on a bad script. Um, I'm also interested in, in compression, especially lossy compression, as it has always been done. Um, and um, other people in our relation group are interested in the relation of uncertainty when you run uh, ensembles. There's some uncertainty in the data and from the model, and to visualize this is not easy. Then weather and climate data is usually usually very multivariate. You have tons of different 2D and 3D variables. Visualizing, visualizing those data side by side without cluttering the display and by providing meaningful information is also sometimes more an art um, yeah, than, than, than a feature. And we are also, of course, interested in machine learning and feature tracking to do um, some computation while the data is, uh, is still in the simulation main memory. Okay, some more interest, uh, more things why we do relation. So first you visualize the data to see something, then you would like to, to understand what you see, eventually learn from that, and then to communicate these findings to your fellow scientists. And in relation, you have um, more, more or less these three cases where you do relation. The first one is confirmative relation. So when you know how the data should look like, you expect a certain pattern in the data. Um, yeah, just like um, the certain um, currents or eddies in the ocean, and if they are not there, or if um, the ocean or the weather patterns look completely screwed up, then you can be sure that um, your module model is, is not running, running well, and there's some a, a bug somewhere. Then exploratory relation, when you have extended your model and you have uh, maybe increased um, the resolution, either temporally or spatially, or you have added um, new features and new processes into your model, then you would like to find new correlations in the data. And for this one, you would need to have an interactive relation where you can explore the data in detail and draw some correlations between a couple of variables. And in the end, what you want to do is creating animations and stills for communication, either for a paper or to present the, the data um, and your findings on a conference. In the animation that you see below, um, you see data from HTCP Square, um, a high resolution simulation um, over Germany, and it's a cut through. Uh, and what you see is um, cloud water, cloud ice, um, volume rendered, and um, the development of certain cloud types and the transitioning from one cloud type to another. And by the way, all the animations that you see or the images that you see in my presentation are done with Paraview. I'm working with Paraview now for probably six or seven years or so, and um, I'm still intrigued by it, what you can do with it. Um, it has a very big community, both on the developers and on the user side. And um, if you ever get stuck in visualizing your data, there's a uh, yeah, uh, easy place to get help. I will tell you later about this in one cell. In this example, I think this animation is a little bit um, slow um, on your side because there's so much information that needs to be transmitted across. What you see is um, for an icon simulation, R to be 10, so 2.5 kilometer globally. And here I display two variables. The white one is liquid cloud water and the turquoise one is cloud ice. This is close up um, over the Atlantic at the equator. And what amazes me with this data is all the details that is in there. And uh, sometimes you don't see yeah, um, everything um, in the data. And there's so much information that it's sometimes difficult to follow. This is some ocean data. Um, this is um, R2B9, so five kilometer ocean data. And what you see here is um, not the top layer, but um, about 70 meter depth, um, the um, velocity, and you see the currents and eddies in the ocean as they're moving and rolling around. 
You can also combine this data for a multivariate visualization. So what you see here is the same data, but um, it is um, displaying two different variables. In color is now displayed salinity. So the more yellow and red the data is, the more salty the water is. And we use bump mapping, um, a shading technique, to visualize the velocity. And here in this example, it's very easy to differentiate between those two variables and they kind of, um, yeah, enhance each other. This is also, also a multivariate visualization, um, not on a long LUT um, projection, but on a spherical projection. What you see here is also um, ocean data and um, salinity here mapped to a different color table and also the velocity field. Um, the velocity field is plotted in two different ways. So for once, it uses um, a lick texture. It's lick stands for line integral convolution, and it's a great tool or great um, function to display global um, flow data, such as in this ocean. And um, then the very strong flow is highlighted by errors, so just like glyphs that you put into the flow and the bigger the glyph is and also from the color you can derive the magnitude of this velocity. And just um, as a fun fact, um, two weeks ago I by accident figured out about the Spielhaus projection and um, I was a little bit fascinated by that because I have not seen that one before. And um, I, of course, had to integrate it into our Icon Paraview plugin. What you see here is um, um, the Spielhaus projection is an oblique slice of the Adam Square 2 projection. But the fascinating thing here is that you see all the oceans of the Earth connected as one body of water and um, without very big distortions and without any intersections. Usually, when you visualize ocean data, on a sphere, you don't have any distortions, but you don't see the other side. And if you use small wider Cassini or um, regular long LUT display, then the ocean is always highly distorted in some areas and um, also intersected. And of course, you can also animate this one. But this function is not yet in the, in the Paraview plugin that, um, that you can download from paraview.org, of course. So now the transition to, to the atmospheric sciences. So this, unfortunately, is, is not a visualization. This is an image from NASA. But uh, what you can see is some um, clouds and um, some cloud formations behind islands. And um, in the early days, um, the ships navigating on sea were looking for these cloud patterns to actually find um, islands. And um, we were looking um, into our data at the exact same location, the Canary Islands, to also find this information, uh, find this um, pattern, the San Carmen Vortex Street um, in the wind field. And this is a 10 meter wind field. It's um, just the Canary Islands um, off the coast of Africa, and it's just um, displayed over the sea. And you can see this, this moving pattern, the San Carmen Vortex Street behind these islands. And I use a couple of different relation techniques that are available in Paraview to dis display this data. And um, I also seeded um, some, some points into the flow um, that get advected with the flow to yeah, see where they accumulate and um, how the flow is progressing. Now displayed is um, the Q criterion. The Q criterion is um, some sort of eddy classifier. So you see where eddies are in the flow and um, Everything what you see here can be very easily done with Paraview if you have the data imported into it. Also, the, the divergence of um, a velocity field can be automatically computed by, by Paraview itself. And then you can use kind of an, a video processing tool to kind of combine all these different relations into one. Um, this is an image. So over the last couple of years, um, one thing that has really gotten its foot into computer graphics is ray tracing. 
Um, you can use ray tracing both on a GPU and on a CPU, and we are collab collaborating here both with NVIDIA as well with um, Intel on this one. And what you see here is a relation of um, the Aguya current um, just on the southern tip of Africa. And you see the um, yeah, velocity currents as streamlines plotted into um, this field and also sea surface height. So where um, you have very um, warm water that is um, taken in from the Indian Ocean. And in this image, I also used um, a technique called depth of field um, to kind of let the user focus really on a certain area that I want to want the user or the one who's looking at the image um, to look at. This again is um, some, some cloud data from over Germany from the HTCP Square project, similar to the animation that you saw first. But now you see the entire simulation domain. And what you see here is um, cloud data, liquid cloud water and cloud ice combined into one variable and then volume rendered using ray casting. You see these nice shadows below the clouds um, that help with, with depth perception. <clears throat> This is an animation that we um, that we just did um, a few months ago for um, an our defunct um, conference submission. What you can see is um, the um, icon or system model, a coupled um, ocean and atmosphere system at um, five five kilometer resolution, and it's also using ray tracing and now pass tracing for visualizing several different quantities. It got a very nice narration, and this video is a VR video, and it's available on, on YouTube as well. And if anybody is interested, and can have more than happy to provide you with a link. And the narration explains uh, a couple of things about the climate system, and especially um, in this location, the island of Borneo, how the clouds are forming and um, developing um, over land um, during the day and then moving off the land during the night. And then the new cycle begins on the next day. OK, so how do we do these? Um, we um, have at DKZ 21 GPU nodes. It's a rather old system. If you just look at uh, what GPUs we have, um, it's Kaplan and Maxwell. But um, the system is still performing well enough for us to visualize our data. As software, we mainly use NCL, Paraview, Vapor, and of course, IDL and Python. And as you can see also, the system is partially equipped with um, terabyte of main memory. And when you're working with Paraview with very, very big data sets, um, sometimes this, this much memory is actually needed. Here's an overview of what relation software is available on Mistral and um, on the ones that are printed in green, we provide tutorials on. We used to use um, Aviso as well. Aviso is a commercial software product, but um, Paraview is much better and it's actually also free. Okay, coming to the second part of the presentation. Um, what you can do with very, very big data sets. The power and power view, of course, stands for parallel. And what you can do with power view, you can run power view in parallel. That means you have one GUI. And then in the back, you have a couple of data render servers that are importing the data and visualizing the data. And all this information is then combined at the user's GUI, um, stream together. And for the user, the work is seamless, but with the benefit that it's, of course, much faster than running single threaded. And he's able to work with bigger data sets. In um, these two images on the right hand side, what you can see on the top um, for the ocean data, you see the decompositioning. Um, this is um, the icon data as it's decomposed. And every different shade of blue or red is rendered on a different machine. And below you see the final composition um, of, of this data. In this case, I think it was temperature. 
And when the user interacts with the data, either apply some thresholds or anything, um, he does not notice that the data is actually rendered and visualized on a couple of different machines. Um, this parallel um, approach works for, for big data, but when the data gets really big, um, it's not working anymore. So now I'm talking about data like R2B11 for ICANN. Um, that would be kind of a global resolution of about one kilometer. And here, the simulation produces so many, so much data that it's difficult to write out the data. And here you have two different solutions. Um, the one I will talk a bit more about is in situation. And the other possibility that you have that we are also looking into is progressive data visualization. Um, yeah. What's the difference between um, yeah, post-relation and in-situation, um, that's displayed here. So this is your normal relation pipeline that you have. You simulate, you have your simulation code and you have all your data in main memory, then you dump it all on disk and you have all the data that you want. Then you read it back in, you extract some information from it and then render it and you have some result like this torus on the right-hand side. The immediate step would be that you perform some data reduction on the main system while the data is still sitting in main memory. And the final in situ implementation would be that you all do uh, it in situ while the simulation is still running. So you simulate all your stuff, then you extract some information and you use this information to render a final image or do whatever with it. So for ICON, we have um, uh, developed a catalyst adapter that actually does this. And the workflow is as follows. Um, using your normal ParaView, you just um, create a Python script that steers this in situ rendering. Um, this Python script can be simply clicked um, together using the GUI, using the interface, and then stored on disk. And later, the ICON model, Fortran code, is using this Python script and steers ParaView using a Catalyst adapter. So what we have is um, this Catalyst adapter that at the beginning for every MPI task submits the grid information to the Catalyst process and then Catalyst tells, Para, uh, tells Ica, uh, ICANN to update the data at certain intervals. These can be specified by the user. And then new data for the variables that are specified within this Python script are streamed to Catalyst. And then you can either create rendered images, um, a cinema database, I tell you in a minute what that is. You can perform some data reduction, for instance, using a threshold filter on cloud data, uh, cloud ice or liquid um, cloud water. You can perform some feature data tracking. So far, we have implemented a cloud classification. You can even perform a live validation so that um, you hook up to the simulation using a PowerView session. And you can see how ICANN is evolving um, the data. And you can also stop the simulation, um, grab the data, inspect it, and see if everything makes sense. This has a couple of advantages and drawbacks, of course. The advantage for doing it in situ would be it, it needs much less I.O. Therefore, the simulation is faster and you just um, have um, less disk space that, that you occupy. You have um, a preview of the data. You can perform some in, in situ computations like feature tracking. And you have the possibility to analyze extremely large simulation outputs. Um, that otherwise would not be um, that easy to achieve. And the time to knowledge, so the time, the time until you get some insight from the data is much. The drawback is that additional resources are required, but we've tested this with um, R2B10 data, and the resources that you actually need are not that much. Um, the biggest drawback is that um, a priori knowledge is needed, so you need to know or anticipate what you would like to visualize. So in this Python script, you specify some certain thresholds um, and you also have to specify a range for a color table. And if you have extended your simulation by new processes or increased the resolution, then it might not be 
as clear to you what you want to visualize. So in a bad case, you need to run the simulation validation again um, to perform a new data analysis and validation. And of course, the workflow complexity increases quite a bit. Okay, so here's just um, a an, an screenshot of um, how to generate this Catalyst script. So you have this Catalyst export inspector, and here you can have some data extracts performing thresholds, for instance, or you can render images, and you can also connect live and perform yeah, several um, operations on that one. But in situ relation is not um, the main topic of uh, uh, yeah, this relation that we perform later. What you see here is um, from this R2P10 simulation, extracted cloud water and cloud ice. So R2P10 3D data is very difficult to handle. But um, with a small threshold, with a very small epsilon, we could kind of remove all these zeros in the data and um, have now some 3D data set that we can interact with on a normal GPU node. Otherwise, that would not have been possible. The Cinema Database um, is an image-based rendering approach where while the data is um, sitting in main memory, um, Catalyst is creating some views on the data from different sites. And later you can use these views, um, these images as preview on the data. For instance, if you have a very large simulation and um, you still store all the data on disk and a scientist is interested in certain cloud types, or the transitioning between one cloud type and another, then instead of loading all the NetCDF files and browsing through the data manually, he could go to, to this website and look at all these images, browse through time, look at the data at the pre-rendered images um, through all these time steps, find the time step um, and the area that he's interested in, and then only has to open this one file. So that makes the workflow for him much easier. Now a couple of thoughts on the implementation and the status of this project, as this is part of Easy Ways 2. Um, we started refactoring other in city code um, that was available from MPath, but that has proven to be much too complex. And we started fresh. Um, it's actually only implemented in a few hundred lines of Fortran and C++ code with basically minimal changes to ICANN itself. All these in situ code is shielded behind if devs and the adapter that we have should be able to relatively easily adapt to other models as well. We now have implemented zero copy arrays from Fortran to C++. Before we were copying the data in main memory, um, but um, also the copying of the data in main memory did not lead to, to very large timings and big resources that we needed. I show this here on the next slide. Um, the way it's running is um, so-called tightly coupled, so in line with an even number of simulation and validation processes. That means for every ICANN MPI task, there's also a Catalyst MPI task, and they are both connected to each other. There's a prototype available on Mistral for ICANN. Um, if you would like to play around with that, please let me know. And um, one very big issue is, of course, the development of workflows for scientists so that they can easily um, deploy this application. Here are some timings um, that we gathered from this one. So from these um, 2.5 kilometer global one, we used 540 nodes on Mistral on this one. And um, I would like to uh, yeah, uh, move your attention to um, the two lowest line model unit and in situ unit. So here from the entire time of one minute, 11 seconds for initializing the model, um, Catalyst needed um, an additional six seconds to to load, out, load all the libraries and initialize. And this only needs to be done once. Then the three lines above this one, um, in situ set var, do work and do work first. Do work first is only called once. And um, this would be in another additional 1.6 seconds. And um, all the other timings are almost um, neglectable in the whole process. 
Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Um, it's now three o'clock. That means I'm kind of right on time. 